Okay, so this uh, concluded everything that I wanted to say about this uh, first row in this uh, table. Uh, once again, I'm using this table to structure the different models that I'm presenting in this uh, chapter two of the course. Now next, uh, let's uh, look at uh, the second row over here. Uh, the second row is uh, labeled communicating finite state machines. Now, in this case, I would like uh, to remind you of the notion of a finite state machine, uh, which is very essential for what we are discussing next. I assume that somewhere you got uh, an introduction to finite state machines, but to be sure that uh, you remember uh, a sufficient amount about it, I have this one slide uh, that hopefully reminds you uh, enough. Uh, so uh, according to this slide, uh, we can describe uh, classical automata uh, as artifacts that uh, have an internal state, typically called Z. We have an output called Y. We have an input called X. And in most of the cases, uh, we implicitly assume the presence of a clock signal Sometimes we really have to figure out whether such a clock signal is implicitly assumed or, or not. In uh, such a model of uh, some uh, uh, artifact, uh, we are indicating the next state, typically uh, with uh, the notation shown over here. Uh, Z plus means uh, this is the next state uh, that uh, the uh, uh, artifact will be in. Uh, this next state is computed by a function delta, and the output is computed by a function lambda. And then we distinguish between more automata and melee automata. For more automata, the output is just a function of the current state, where, and uh, the next state is a function of the current input and the current state. Uh, for melee automata, it's uh, similar, but still a little different. It's different in that for uh, the output, we also uh, need uh, to consider the, the current input because uh, the current output is a function of both the current input uh, and the current state. Now these uh, finite state machines, uh, they are typically described in uh, state diagrams. Uh, you see a state diagram on, on the right. In this case, we are representing a Moore automaton. And uh, this means that we can indicate uh, the, the output uh, already for each and, and every of the states because the output is just a function of uh, the states. So you see the different outputs here in the lower half of these circles. And in the upper half, you see the name of the state. And uh, the uh, transitions from one state to the next, they are represented by uh, the edges over here. And we can assume that initially we start in some state. And furthermore, we assume that uh, our input E is equal to one. And usually we assume that there is this clock signal present and uh, with some relation to the clock signal, these uh, uh, transitions are assumed to take place. So typically, for example, we assume that transitions take place uh, only if we have a rising edge of the clock signal or if we have a falling edge. Uh, in, in certain rare cases, uh, we are working with asynchronous machines that don't have a clock. But for uh, our purposes, I think we can assume that there is always such a clock signal. So if we have such a transition, then uh, after that transition took place, we will be in the next state. And uh, if the input condition is met again, we will have then a transition into the next state and we can also have a transition into the fourth state. Now, this uh, shouldn't actually be new. This should, should, this should just be a reminder of something that you learned in, in earlier courses. So in general, uh, the uh, machines that we are considering in this context, they can be classified as either more or melee machines, depending on uh, the dependency of, of the output on, on the input. Now, with uh, these classical machines, we have a number of limitations. So in many ways, they are not powerful enough uh, for what we need in, in our context. 
I mentioned that we need hierarchy, we need to describe time, etc. Uh, all this is not available with uh, standard finite state machines, so we have to do something about it. And the first thing that we do about it is uh, to introduce time. We need to consider time when we have uh, these automata, and if we include a model of time, uh, we are uh, uh, starting to introduce so-called timed automata. So timed automata are automata uh, combined with a model of time. In, such, in this case, we are introducing variables, which are uh, assumed to be uh, logical clocks of the system. Uh, these variables are assumed to be initialized with zero when the system is started, and then are assumed to increase synchronously with the same rate. That means that uh, we assume that, that all these uh, clock variables will, will increase at the same rate. And then, in addition, we introduce so-called clock constraints, which are guards on the edges, and these clock constraints are used to restrict the behavior of the automaton. So we can make the overall behavior of the automaton uh, clock-dependent or time-dependent. Um, a transition, which is uh, represented uh, by an edge in this diagram, can be taken when the clock values satisfy the guard labeled on, on the edge. Uh, th such a transition does not need to be taken if that guard is, uh, uh, is, is met. So for example, if we have a transition over here where we have a label x uh, 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 larger than or equal to 4, uh, this means that at any time, uh, starting at time 4, this transition can take place, but it does not need to take place. Yeah? In order to make sure that these transitions uh, uh, really take place, we can use additional invariants that uh, we attach to the states. So like in this case, uh, we have an additional invariant which states that we are in the state uh, no longer than until time 5, that means somewhere between time, time 4 and 5, we must be leaving uh, that state. Yeah? OK. Um, clocks may be reset to 0 when a transition is taken. So we can indicate next to these edges that a clock is assumed to be reset to 0. What I'm presenting over here is one particular model of timed automata. There are others, but I'm constraining myself to just one particular model of timed automata. Using this model of uh, timed automata, uh, I can uh, describe uh, an application. In various cases, I'm using this answering machine as an application. And in this case, I'm describing an answering machine um, in as a timed automata model. Uh, so in this case, we are starting at a starting state. Um, this uh, is denoted with uh, uh, two circuits to, to make sure that this is considered something special. So that's the starting state. And then we assume that there is a, a ring signal. Whenever there's a ring signal, we have a transition to this uh, state called waiting state. And at that time, we are resetting our clock signal to zero. Now you see that in this waiting state, we cannot exceed uh, time 5. Uh, 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 after time 5, we have to be at some other state. Now starting at uh, time uh, x equals 4, we can have a transition into this state. Uh, if, however, the user of the answering machine is picking up the headset earlier, we have a transition into that state, and then the, the user of the answering machine uh, can talk to the calling person and after some time possibly return the handset and at that time we will go into that state which I'm not uh, uh, describing in detail, I'm just calling this a, a so-called dead state. Now, uh, if uh, the user does not pick up the phone, uh, then we will play uh, the, the text. Sorry, there's nobody at home, please leave your name and a message or something like that. And at that time, we are resetting the clock. Uh, we are uh, starting the beep. Uh, there is a limit on the time for the beep. We see that we could leave this uh, state where we are transmitting the beep, uh, starting at time uh, y equals 1. 
the beep could last until time y equals 2. Uh, if we leave that particular state, we are resetting clock variable x again. There we are starting the recording. We can see that we are leaving the recording uh, starting possibly at time x equals 8, but we will be in this recording state no longer than until time 9. So we see in this case the use of uh, multiple clocks. We see clocks uh, x and y. Actually, we could have constrained ourselves to the use of just one clock. I introduced two clocks only for demonstration purposes. Actually, there is not really the need to have two clocks over here. Also, you see that in certain cases, we are resetting these clocks. And I think it's also already obvious that if we are using many of such clock variables, it becomes di very difficult to understand these models. If you have a hundred clock variables, I think you would be unable to figure out what's really going on. So this was an informal introduction of uh, timed automata. Now let's look at timed automata in a mi little more formal way. So uh, formally, uh, we have to consider uh, the set of uh, clock variables. C will denote uh, the, the clock variables, which we can think of being real valued variables, real, real valued uh, uh, variables. Then sigma uh, represents the finite alphabet of possible inputs. And we have to define possible uh, syntactical forms for clock constraints. In this case, we are constraining ourselves to clock constraints that are so-called conjunctive formulas of atomic constraints. That means our uh, formulas have to be of the form where we have one variable, where we have some operator and we have a constant, or we can have the difference between such two clock variables. We can have one operator and we can have a constant and these operators are uh, comparison operators. So there is this restricted set of possible uh, syntactical forms for the constraints. Then B of C denotes the set of uh, clock constraints. So these are all the possible clock constraints. And then we can formally define a timed uh, automaton uh, as a, a tuple comprising S, this, this is the set of states, uh, S0, this is the initial state, uh, e, this is a set of edges, and i, and this is a set of invariants. So we see s is a finite set of states, s0 is the initial state, and uh, maybe we need a couple of seconds to discuss uh, uh, what I put there for the form of the edges. So for the edges, we know that we are starting in a particular state, that's what the s stands for. Uh, then we can have uh, a subset of uh, the set of uh, clock constraints here for any of the edges. Uh, also, uh, we can have uh, uh, one element of the input, input alphabet there, so there can be one signal that denotes uh, an input signal. And then there can be uh, one element from the power set of the uh, uh, clock signals. This is the set of uh, clock signals that we are resetting for a particular edge. And this is uh, the uh, uh, terminating edge. That's the uh, the edge to that's the node to which a particular edge is is leading. And then we have uh, i. This is a set of invariants. Uh, this is the uh, set of uh, uh, constraints that we can attach to the different states that we have in such a system. So um, demonstrating this again for our particular example. Uh, we see the use of these clock signals here, we see the use of invariance, we see the use of the input alphabet, and we see again uh, the uh, use of the power set of variables, that means the variables that we are resetting there. So this demonstrates how we are able to uh, use uh, these uh, uh, timed uh, automata in, in practice. I think it's already obvious from, from this example that uh, timed automata are useful, uh, but they do not necessarily solve all the problems. So for example, in standard uh, forms of timed automata, we don't have any hierarchy, uh, so uh, that, that may be a problem. Also, there are no programming language elements, uh, uh, there is no object orientation, so, so anything in that direction is missing. So in certain contexts, timed automata are good, but in other contexts, they are not sufficient. 
So this leads me to the uh, summary for today. Um, at the beginning of this lecture, I motivated the use of uh, non von Neumann models. We saw that uh, inherent with the use of von Neumann models, we have certain problems. And therefore, it's a good idea to look around for other options. We should be aware of the fact that in certain cases, it might be better to use other models. So therefore, we have uh, started to look at the different entries there in this uh, table. And we started by looking at the first row. There we saw the support for early design phases. Uh, this was covered only briefly because I would like to minimize the overlap with the course on software engineering. Nevertheless, I wanted to mention the, these early phases. So we see that uh, for the early phases, we can use text. Uh, we can employ use cases. Um, we can be using sequence charts. And we also saw uh, uh, some information on possible extensions of sequence charts. And then we started the discussion of automata models. And as a first uh, example of uh, a necessary extension, uh, I introduced the notion of uh, timed automata. So this uh, concludes uh, this uh, third uh, lecture in which uh, hopefully I uh, taught you something about the embedded systems fundamentals of cyber physical systems. Thank you very much. <laughs>